What's up everybody, just really quick before I get into the interview, I just want to let you guys know, stay for the whole video because at the end I'm going to be premiering a brand new Equip and R23X song. Hope you guys check it out and enjoy it. All right, what's up everybody? Welcome back to the pad and today we got Chicago producer who has hit the head on the nail of Combining that vaporwave and video game sound pretty much. We are here with Equip. How are we doing brother? Good good. Thanks for having me pad. No problem. Thank you for uh, for coming to chill at the pad So we got we have a lot to talk about um, Obviously your I dreamed of a castle in the sky vinyl is completely sold out on hundred percent electronica congrats on that uh, huge Thank accomplishment, you. especially, I mean, we see in the Vaporwave community, a lot of these pressings will be pressed at like 100, 200. So I think, I believe it was 500, right? The, the, with 100% Electronica? Yep, we did 500. We were going to do 400. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of the, the number that I had in my head, but it was actually cheaper to do 500, so why not? Oh, there you go. That, that, <laughs> that bulk price. But yeah, so that, that dropped. You had um, Synthetic Core, right? Which was also. Yep. Another and, and what's really cool about the two, which I, I really like, is uh, I feel like a lot of people, especially with video game composed music I've heard before, they it, it's kind of hard to go from one almost like platform or generation of a console sound to another. And when I heard Synthetic Core, the, the especially like the first time I listened to it, the first thing I thought was just that um, that dreamy ocarina of time feel which i absolutely i think everybody's a sucker for that and then um i dreamed of a palace in the sky was a return to that more jrpg super nintendo style and it reminds me a lot of like stardew valley games like that which i absolutely love so uh let me stop talking because I, I talk way too much tell me about your how you go about producing these tracks uh what you put into them and how you just figure that sound out that you want to go with um it, I guess it always is uh, it's somewhat of a different approach every time it really just depends on what I'm listening to what I'm inspired by what I'm feeling um, I'm currently kind of in the process of making new equip music so I guess now is a, a good time as any to <laughs> dive into the compositional process awesome. uh, a lot of times I, I'm just listening to music and I hear something I really like or something I kind of want to emulate mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I'll, I use Ableton Live to make all my stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll, I'll just open it up, and um, a lot of times I'll start riffing on top of, like, a pre-existing track, just kind of jamming and seeing if I get any ideas out of that. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, sometimes I start with drums. Sometimes I start with just, like, a bass little arpeggiated melody. Sometimes I start with chords. It really just depends on the vibe I'm trying to go for, and uh, also where I am too. I find that I'm really influenced by uh, different environments. Like yesterday, I took my uh, laptop down to a nice public park and mm -hmm. kind of like laid out on a blanket and worked on music there. And I found that uh, when I was done, it was like more relaxing, kind of ambient stuff. Whereas, you know, sometimes I'll be sitting in my room, hyped up on coffee, and I'll. <laughs> make a, a battle theme or something mm -hmm. like that um but yeah I, I find it helps to to kind of compose off of pre-existing stuff and then later you know remove any elements that aren't original mm -hmm. um sometimes you know i'll i'll just hear a nice chord in a chord progression and i'll be like i want to use that chord <laughs> so i'll start that as kind of the the building block and then i'll build on from that mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, I, I know uh, one thing I really do love about your sound is the amount of sounds that go into a song. So I feel like nowadays, you know, everyone, especially, in, you know, with Vaporwave and, and these, you know, Bandcamp community genres, we try to pump out as much stuff as possible. And we try to get it on there as quick as possible. But with your sound, you really just you add so many things to it. And it's not like, you know, you're just putting a drum and a bass and like two little sounds and then you're releasing it you know like there's really so much to listen to and that's that's what i really love about um the i dreamed of a castle in the sky is 
every time I re-listen to it, it's like I find another instrument in there that I didn't hear the first time, which I think is, which which is great. And I love video game music, so it's thank you. It's definitely cool. Thank no you. no problem. So obviously, uh, your music is very influenced from video games. Uh, yep. so, so I love video games. Let's let's talk about them. Um, what is your favorite video game of all time, and why? Or if you have multiple, I mean, whatever you got. I, I've, so I've been thinking about this mm-hmm. uh, since this morning, and uh, <laughs> I had to kind of like look over my game collection. Uh-huh. And uh, I, man, if I had to choose just one game, mm-hmm. uh, it would probably be um, Legend of Zelda: Link's Awakening for Game Boy. Hmm. That was a uh, that was a really, really important game for me, um, and I, I feel like I've played and revisited that specific Zelda more than any other one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't, I, I don't quite know if it's like the nostalgia of me only having a Game Boy instead mm-hmm. of a console growing up, or yeah. if that's like has to do with the music, which is just it's so simple yet so effective. You know, there's never more than like. I think the Game Boy has, what, three or four channels of audio, and that's it. Mm -hmm. But they're able to make such crazy, complex, memorable melodies out of that little chip that it's really just stuck with me through the years. Definitely. uh, It's kind of a toss-up between that and Final Fantasy VI, Mm -hmm. which uh, was kind of the first... Besides Seven, that was my first, like really big rpg that i saw through from start to finish you Mm -hmm. know turn-based rpg Uh, and that too is just that's everything about that game is is so beautiful the art the characters the music Mm -hmm. the story is like really enthralling there's moments of like genuine surprise and shock and horror and it's there's so many characters too and i feel like they all have emotional depth for you know having <laughs> been 16-bit RPG sprites, <laughs> you really feel like you, you know them and sympathize with their plight by the end of the story. Mm-hmm. And yeah, those those two games are probably the big ones for me, Final Fantasy VI and Link's Awakening. Now, the Link's Awakening, because when, when I was growing up, I know on the Game Boy, I all I had was, was Pokemon Blue version and, like, Super Mario Land were the only two games I ever played. And, I, and like, your with your thing, you know, I played them over and over again. I'm actually... Um, Sometimes I live stream Pokemon Green version, which is the Japanese release. Oh yeah, yeah. So that. that, so that, and I, I don't want to speak Japanese, but I've played the game so much, I, you know, can trust you myself going. Go. I just know where to go. I know what, <laughs> you know, in the PC, I know which is the deposit, the release, whatever. So now for yeah. the Link's Awakening, was that the? I could be completely wrong. Was that the one? It was like a blue cartridge and a red cartridge. No, it's um. Th- so they originally did it for you know the black and white game boy mm-hmm. uh and then they they did remake it as a color version it's link's awakening dx and it's a black cartridge you know what no i'm thinking i'm actually thinking of isn't there one it's like oracle of time oracle of seasons or something oh yeah like that? that's yeah. what i'm thinking of so i meant the label not the not the cartridge those are great too i remember mm-hmm. saving up my allowance money for quite some time <laughs> i think i got like five dollars a week back then so yep. it would be like I, I i saved up my allowance money hardcore to buy those two on the day they dropped that's awesome. Uh, but yeah, I bought I bought them both upon release at Best Buy, like mm-hmm. w- when they came out, and I still have them, you know, complete in box. That's awesome. That's awesome. yeah. My um my my actual and I know you you're into game collecting, which I used to be. I still am. Like I, I it's very interesting, you know, just like reading up on it, seeing what people have and everything. And I I've sold at least like eighty percent of my gaming collection all the way. But in terms of just stuff that. I'll never get rid of. I, I do have my, uh, it's still on my shelf. I'm looking at it right now. My factory sealed blue version. I got this like custom, oh, uh, yeah. custom case for it and everything like that. And then I have a couple, I have a, what do I have? I'm trying to think of, cause everything's like packed in a box. I, like the, my good ones. I got, uh, the blue version. I have a factory sealed Mario party Two, which is like my favorite Mario party. Nice. Yeah. So I got that one. Um, I have That's an analog stick ruiner right there. Oh yeah. Oh, and a palm, <laughs> palm ruiner too. Like I think my palm is still scarred <laughs> from that shit. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, so then I have that. And then once, um, I mean, I don't know about you. Do you, uh, did you go, I'm sure you did go like garage sailing and yard sailing for, uh, for games. Yeah, I, or, yeah. I still do. It's, it's crazy. The, the amount of stuff that still turns up, mm-hmm. um, 
my, one of my friends, uh, his name's Robbie. He plays in like a local grindcore band. He's like really, really, he's hitting the garage sales every single Saturday and Sunday morning. And mm-hmm. some of the stuff that he texts me is just amazing. Like he got a, a complete in box, like a CD with like, wow. like 12 complete games for like 40 bucks the other day. <laughs> And yeah, believe it or not, there are still deals to be had from going to garage sales. That is <laughs> flea crazy. markets not so much anymore because everybody's got you know a smartphone and can look stuff up on eBay. But mm-hmm. yeah, garage sales uh, are still a huge source of affordable retro games. That's wild. I know I stopped. I want to say around like 2016, and I remember I was hitting just like duds for weekends, just going to garage. I got nothing was turning up, but before then, yeah, like there was some insane once i got a a guy brought out a box of was it i think it was sega cd but a, a, yeah sega cd that's like the the tall vertical glass jewel cases right yeah 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 they break really easy yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> so he he pulled out those and it had like rayman in it area 51 like a bunch of games that i didn't even knew at the time were that that valuable and i looked them up and i was like oh my god but yeah i've gotten um a sealed original game boy once at a sale Oh wow! And, then, and here's a crazy one. I once got a box Game Boy, the same one, not sealed though, but it was a box Game Boy. A guy had a bin labeled remotes, and it was in there. Yeah, a box Game Boy was in a, yeah, a bin labeled remotes, and I was like, oh my god! So then I think the guy he sold the it for like stuff I about. yeah, yeah, yep. And I think he sold it for like three or four bucks or something. But absolutely mm-hmm. crazy, good times. But yeah, that's um, what what about you? What's uh? Any, any stars? I guess in the collection you'd uh, you want to talk about? Yeah, um, I I was uh, I was looking at my collection this morning. And I think, like the one that that kind of sticks out the most for me, where I'm just like I can't believe I have this. <laughs> finally, is um, I bought a complete in box uh, Hagane for Super Famicom um, mm. in Japan last year, and that was like the most I've ever dropped on. <laughs> one specific game Mm -hmm. uh it was about 150 bucks us Mm -hmm. but uh i I rationalized it because it was only released as a blockbuster exclusive Mm -hmm. over here so it's nearly impossible to find a us complete in box because most of the rental stores just threw out the boxes you know Mm -hmm. i never saw any rental stores growing up that like hadn't totally shelled out the boxes to make the the display yeah pieces you know it's most of them are either cut up or destroyed mm-hmm. uh, and the cartridge alone that for the u.s version i think goes for about four or five hundred bucks now wow. so uh, it seemed like a bargain to yeah no definitely <laughs> at, at that price that's pretty wild uh, um how was japan by the way i'm like i feel like everyone's dying to go to japan <laughs> how it's amazing is it um I, I went with two of my friends uh Colin and Joe. Colin is, uh, he does an amazing kind of sample based ambient collage uh, project called Antlered. And my friend Joe does a really cool kind of 90s IDM inspired project called Bastion Void. Cool. And they set up some shows. Um, and I mean, we, we were originally planning on just, just going for the heck of it, but they wanted to play some shows. And I was like, well, I'm not really in a position to. To play right now i hadn't mm-hmm. really figured out my live set at the time so i just went to scope it out basically mm-hmm. uh, but we had so much fun it was so life-changing i i feel like i really gained a new perspective and appreciation for the culture that there's no way that you can soak in you know just reading books and, and watching movies and stuff yeah um and yeah i just uh just the other day bought a ticket to go back this year awesome um i'm actually gonna go with uh with R23X and nice. Death's Dynamic Shroud. Oh, uh, that's sick. We're, we're hoping to play some shows over there as well. That is awesome. Good for you guys. That's that's pretty sweet. Yeah. I think, yeah, me and my girlfriend, we've been, like, planning to go. Um, we, we're so lame. Like, we, we plan to do these, like, cool trips. Like, we wanted to go to the Grand Canyon. We wanted to, you know, like, try Japan and whatnot. But every year we just end up going on a cruise. It's just, like, so simple. So that's, like, <laughs> like next week I'm going on a cruise, like, a bunch of 70-year-old people. But there's the all-you-can-drink, yeah. all-you-can-drink package, so I, I'm a I'm a happy camper. But one day I will go to Japan. That's yeah. definitely definitely a plan. Um, so you've released I Dream of Castle in the Sky with 100% Electronica, so you've worked with George Clinton, everyone's favorite. What is it like yeah. being a part of 100% Electronica and working with George? 
it's great. I'm like just positively thrilled about uh, about our relationship. Mm. I think it's. Um, I was really, really like honored and humbled when George um, reached out to see if we wanted to do a final version of this. And mm. uh, yeah, I mean, he was he was totally supportive of however I wanted the packaging to be, and I. I was really pretty insistent on getting a new piece commissioned from uh, Keith, Keith Rankin. Yeah, the, that it's amazing looking. The so gatefold. cool. And yeah, I was just really happy that he was, you know, he found it in the budget to, to mm -hmm. commission Keith again, which was really nice. And uh, yeah, ultimately it, it sounds and looks and exactly how I kind of had pictured it to be. So I'm, I'm super happy with it. George is just the nicest guy and mm -hmm. he's been extremely easy to work with and um, it, it helps, you know, knowing the people that you release music with. And, uh, yeah, I, I got to see him play, um, twice now in Chicago. Once, uh, I played with him and, uh, Negative Gemini as well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, it's, it, it, it's really, really nice and comforting to, to be working with hundred percent electronic that he's been nothing but easy to work with and super transparent and, yeah, I'm I'm excited to do some stuff with him in the future. Cool, very very cool. Um, I've seen like clips of George Clanton playing live, and I mean I don't know if it's just the edits because a lot of people and we all you know think this like how it's a big discussion. How would vaporwave and just this style of music we all do? Uh, how would it translate to a live performance? Because obviously you're gonna think, okay, if someone's just playing this like ambient stuff, is everyone just gonna be sitting there and whatnot? And George's <laughs> music is not really like that, but like I was saying, from the clips that I've seen, they look like wild. Like George is like jumping all over the place, and so it. How is it? How's the whole live experience? And from your perspective, um, what do you think? I guess would be next for the genre, or what do you think the genre could do or would do in regards to advancing uh, the whole live scene? Because I think there's there's a lot to you know to do bringing the community together. And um, so yeah, what do you think? Well, George's live show is. Um that, that was kind of what inspired me to get my own live show together mm -hmm. and yeah he's he's super high energy you know he he gives the crowd what they want he runs around and crowd surfs and you know jumps into the audience mm -hmm. and he really really gets into it and I think that's that's really important to mm -hmm. appear confident and composed on stage and he's he's given folks what they paid for you know like an awesome high energy live show it's it's really incredible. Uh, Negative Gemini as well. She's she puts a hundred percent into it, and it really shows. I mean, it's it's inspiring to play with two people that you know are, are eating, thinking, breathing nothing but their own music. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as the future of uh, live performance, I I mean, I use a, an MPC to kind of trigger my samples in real time. Mm -hmm. And what I would like to do, and I've uh, actually done a couple of rehearsals, is kind of um, segment out the parts to different performers and do more of a live band feel. Oh, that's cool. Uh, and I think that's that's ultimately, if people want to make a compelling live Vaporwave show, I think that you, <laughs> I mean, try your best to to break down the music into okay this is a bass part this is a drum part mm -hmm. and you know set up either synths or midi controllers or whatever you you use to compose and actually try to mock up what a live band would be playing on stage you know <laughs> grab your grab your friend and give him some drumsticks and <laughs> teach him how to play your song and, yeah you know find the best bassist you know and get him to play the bass parts and yeah, that's that's eventually where I would like to go with my music, um, and I, I would love to see other people doing, you know, live original vaporwave. I think mm. that's a really cool idea that a lot of people haven't explored yet. Mm -hmm. I a hundred percent agree. I, I I've always thought, you know, that idea of just live instrumentation vaporwave, um, kind of just recreating the sample live. I think would be such a cool, exciting, yeah. you know, thing to see instead of just. You know, someone sitting there pressing the play button and, and then, you know, just like chilling. Um, I think that would be cool. Yeah, and the, the whole energy thing, that's another big thing. I've seen uh, Flamingosis a couple months ago. And even oh, though cool. he's not really, you know, like vaporwave or future funk in a way, he's kind of just like 
a mix with more just hip hop instrumentation and Latin disco, whatever. But I kind of I've always put them in the same realm in a way. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's something I've always done. Vapor adjacent. <laughs> there you go. Vapor adjacent. So when I saw him, the first thing he was doing, and it was so ob- obvious to his character, he was so confident um, with what he was doing. And he had his laptop. He had his you know his stuff there. But the energy was there, and he caught everyone in the first minute just by doing that. So, yeah, I agree. I think, I think too, you know, two big things would be the confidence. And from what I saw, you know, George definitely has that. And then just original live instrumentation I think would be another really cool thing so I know um Macross does he like he's popping and slapping the bass on top of his tracks Mm -hmm. I've seen that on Twitter yeah yeah that looks really really cool I'd love Mm. to see him live or play a show with him someday Mm -hmm. that would be amazing that would be sweet Uh, I've I've seen some other people do some cool stuff there was a a video from way back of um couple of those florida cats i think uh dan mason and Mm -hmm. um uh maybe cobalt road i can't remember i'm so sorry if i'm getting these wrong but they were covering an r23x song live with like you know bass and keys and stuff and uh it was a um windows 98 too Mm -hmm. um uh what's his name dan um yeah it was it was a super cool performance concept I, I, it would be really really cool to see more groups doing live stuff like that yeah definitely 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 um okay so let's see so what is your or who is actually who is your favorite musical artist of all time you know influentially and i guess album as well and it, it doesn't have to be vaporwave related just it could be anything so um i man this is another really tough question i know these these are pretty these are pretty I, if like asked on a random day, you know, by somebody off the street, who my favorite musical artists were, I'd probably say either uh, the Cocteau Twins or My Bloody Valentine. Okay. I've, I've been uh, huge into those bands for so long, and their I feel like their albums and lyrics and stuff are just kind of etched into my brain at mm-hmm. this point. And uh, yeah, I mean, I I do like Vaporwave a lot, but it's uh, not. I don't really listen to Vaporwave on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I kind of like, um, I don't know. I, I like to, to kind of mix it up. And for me, those two bands are, they've always like been there for me, you know? Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're one of those things where you're having like a rough day and I know mm-hmm. like, it's like comfort food for your ears mm-hmm. <laughs> I can throw on my bloody Valentine and crank it up really loud and like just kind of lose myself for a while. Uh, but yeah, I, I I went through a huge like dream pop, uh, mm-hmm. shoegaze fan, um, or sorry, um, uh, I went through a period where I, I listened to a lot of that stuff, and uh, I I don't quite jam it as much as I would like to anymore, but um, it's always there, and yeah, it's like it's built into my brain at this point. Mm-hmm. Associate like like shoegaze with more like noise rock. And, okay. Like, like cocktail twins for me are are less shoegaze and they're more like dream pop Mm. um in terms of like how the the genre tag actually describes the sound Mm -hmm. um but yeah there's a there's a big intersection between noise rock and dream pop so i think that's where the tag came from okay so for obvious reasons um I dreamed of a castle in the sky, as I was saying before. It always reminded me of Stardew Valley with its huge range and setting. And what I mean by that is on the album, your sound varies on a multitude of levels, and it gives you that aura of all the possible areas like a a classic JRPG may have, from like a cave or an ocean and whatnot. And it's not just, you know, the same. It's not like a a horror vibe the whole time, an action vibe the whole time. It goes all over the place. So obviously that's you know, influence from games with a lot of these amazing soundtracks. So if you had to pick, what are some of your, I know you said before Legend of Zelda, uh, but are there any other favorite soundtracks of yours or scores in video games that you just absolutely love? Um, yeah, I'll tell you what I've been into lately is um, I just beat Shenmue mm-hmm. for Dreamcast. And um, a lot of the, the like ambient music when you're just walking around Yakuska is just really really amazing it's all like really short loops and they're kind of these long drawn out pads that are kind of uh kind of bit crushed and and grainy but Mm. it just 
it really just creates this huge vibe that uh it's so simple you know it's, it's just a couple of notes but mm -hmm. it, it really is uh consuming and intoxicating um i i was joking around with uh james webster of uh death dynamic shroud and, mm -hmm. uh we're, we're gonna try to visit yakuska where shenmue is modeled after oh that's um, cool he went there he went there earlier this year or was late last year and i was like did you listen to the like ambient music on headphones while you were walking around yakuska because i feel like i would have to do that mm -hmm. and he was like no i just kind of forgot you know i was he's too concerned with you know being in mm -hmm. yakuska just being there to, yeah. Like, yeah yeah uh but yeah the shenmue score is awesome um i really have been into uh hitoshi sakamoto lately he uh, is most known for his uh, soundtracks for Final Fantasy XII and Final Fantasy Tactics. Cool. But he did a couple soundtracks for um, like shoot 'em up games, uh, shmups, mm -hmm. on uh, on the Sega Saturn. One called uh, Sukyu Gurentai, and there's another one called uh, Radiant Silver Gun. And both of those are just like really, really amazing, um, kind of pulse pounding uh, orchestral scores that really give you like a sense of, of moving around in the air, uh, mm. which I'm, I've been making a lot of like airship sounding music lately. So it's good, uh, inspiration fuel. Um, I've also been really enjoying the, uh, I've never played the game, but, uh, the threads of fate soundtrack, it's like a PS one RPG. Um, the composers, uh, Junya Nakano, I think, uh, probably butchering that Ju Junya, Hunya, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's it's really really good. It's it's more like it reminds me of 16-bit kind of um, Chrono Trigger like mm -hmm. sounds. It, it's less like real orchestral stuff and more kind of like plastic orchestra, uh, which is another thing that I've been uh, messing around with a lot is uh, busting out the sound canvas and mm -hmm. getting like a good mix of like real orchestral sounds mixed with the kind of fake MIDI orchestral sounds. Very cool. That Yeah, I'm sure that, that provides such a nice dynamic range of just, you know, yeah. just layering and, and whatnot. Mark, um, R23X and I have been working on a record for uh, about six months now just through Dropbox. Mm. And... Uh, two weeks ago he actually came to chicago for uh yeti records had like a little showcase mm -hmm. warehouse party thing um and we both got to play that and uh he stayed at my house for a couple of days and we just got to hang out and uh eat snacks and <laughs> play video games and uh, work on music a little bit but yeah that's something we've been doing a lot is mixing the more symphonic mm -hmm. elements of rpg scores with the more kind of plastic general midi like SNES sounding instruments as well. And it's a really cool fusion. It, mm -hmm. I, think, I think people will like it if we ever finish the record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that stuff takes so, so long. But yeah, I, I, that, like I was just saying before, you know, anything that's just going to add to a range is great. And it just, I, I feel like not even just, you know, just adding sound after sound after sound, but those real life sounds, those real time synths or just pads low in the background are going to, you know, add some structuring for those cruddy, uh super nintendo like rough kind of sounds and so yeah. that definitely definitely exciting to uh to hear about that um yeah, field recordings too we've been we've been digging into like you know rain sounds and more atmospheric kind of sounding stuff and it's crazy how you can just have a single synth line and it doesn't really sound like anything but then you put like uh some woods <laughs> sound effects in the background with like you know bugs and mm -hmm. Um, birds and that kind of stuff. It, it, it just kind of creates a, an environment around you, which mm -hmm. is something I've always been kind of obsessed with in my music is making like sonic environments mm -hmm. uh, yeah. to kind of augment your real life experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I, you see it all over um, on the I Dreamed of a Castle in the Sky. I, it, so it's definitely definitely present and it uh it sounds great i specifically kind of put myself in different environments to to try to evoke that you know i, I looked at a bunch of classic rpg soundtracks and mm -hmm. most of them are just long as heck you know they'll <laughs> two two discs with you know 50 plus tracks and i wanted to make something like that where mm -hmm. it kind of hit on all of these um sonic environments but wasn't like trying to digest an entire game score i wanted to make it so you could listen to it in one sitting mm -hmm. well i think uh, the, the other yeah. 
the great thing about it is it's 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 definitely long, and I've said that in the review. It's it's like twenty five or twenty six tracks, I believe, something yeah. like that. But it doesn't sound like you know you're just adding length for the sake of adding length to make it like some video game soundtrack because you have all those um, different sounds and just different areas of a game and whatnot. So I've thought about making like uh, it's funny you said making them artificially longer. I've thought about mm -hmm. making like videos on YouTube that are just like some of the loops from those, but mm -hmm. extended to, you know, hour lengths and stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I see a lot of those videos for uh, video game music on YouTube where it'll be like, oh, here's the battle theme from Final Fantasy VI looping for mm -hmm. half an hour or whatever. Yeah, you just got <laughs> and, lost uh, in it. Yeah, totally. And I mean, that's how it's looping in the game. So yeah, I've, I've kind of thought about making separate loops for a lot of the tracks that'll just keep going and going and going and uploading them on my YouTube channel. Cool. Yeah, that'd definitely be cool. Especially for synthetic core. I think that, that a, a lot of people were like, oh, I wish the battle theme was longer. Mm -hmm. And I actually looped it twice in the original version, and it sounded like it was like too long. So I just wanted it to be mm -hmm. one loop on the album. But yeah, I guess, you know, nothing's stopping you from <laughs> dragging it into Audacity and looping it yourself. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you played um, The Herbs. <laughs> oh my god. Um, your, Dude, I've know, been like obsessed with that. Advance. I don't know why. I'm like, <laughs> I've been dying to play it like all week. It's the weird, yeah. it's so weird. It's, it's like, it's actually pretty fun. It's actually pretty fun. And I, the story about that's really funny. I was a kid. I went to my cousin's house one day and he had it. And I played it for like five minutes. I was like, I used to love The Sims when I was a kid. I was like, oh, this is Ew. so good. So I, I just like, I literally just stole it from him. And then nice. <laughs> years passed by. So I, the other day, I'm like, I'm trying to find something new to stream. So I'm going through, because right now I, I just moved. So a lot of my stuff is still packed. Yeah. But I have my GameCube and my Game Boy player like right on my desk near my laptop. So I'm kind of limited to either stuff from the GameCube or Game Boy. So I was looking through a bunch of old Game Boy games. I'm like, what am I going to play? So I'm looking, and like I said, you know, I have a ton of Pokemon stuff. That's that's really all I played back then. I have Kingdom Hearts, uh, Mem Chain of Memories, I think it was called. Chain of Memories. Yeah, Chain of Memories, yeah. yep. So that, I was like, maybe I'll play that. But then I didn't feel like playing a, you know, card turn-based game. I was like, whatever. So then the herbs popped up. I was like, what the hell is this? I, I forgot about what it was. And then I remembered. I was like, oh, my God. Like, what is more aesthetic than, like, early 2000s urban life? Right. <laughs> like what is just better than that and like I, i'm from new york so it's just it was immediate just flashback so i was like i gotta play but yeah Perfect. i'm uh i'm living my life through uh my herb right now that's that's, <laughs> that's where i'm standing so I'm, I'm probably gonna stream that maybe today i don't know well now whenever whoever's watching this video this is probably you know a while ago but I don't know. I got. I'm. I'm thinking of other things to stream. I, my big thing is, and I know we've talked about this before in the past, and I think it would be so cool for the channel, is getting, uh, a live stream going where we're playing a game with another artist, so like me or you, or, or yeah. like me or George Clan or something. But I have no clue how to work anything, hardware or software. I'm just ridiculous. So I. That's something I still got to figure out. So hopefully, everyone in the future, you'll see some, uh, some live play. Get like me, you know, me and equip or me and someone else. So that's that's definitely in store for the future. Yeah, George and I got that that um, mm -hmm. that Mame emulator running um, with Netplay. Uh, it was really really choppy and it dropped out a lot, but mm -hmm. it kind of worked. Uh, I think you could probably maybe just find a better style of gameplay mm -hmm. to do over Netplay, so it's not like. Like nothing that you would need reflexes for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that's kind of lacking. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's uh, George put up like a live stream of him playing with um, satin sheets, uh, Ben Pogson, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's really fun just to like watch them play and talk to each other. Yeah, it's like kind of cutting in and out of conversation to talk <laughs> about the game they were playing. I think it was uh, Alien vs Predator for arcade. Oh my gosh. Um, but yeah, that that was really cool. I hope we can get that figured out. Yeah, definitely. I'm definitely gonna look into more of that. Um, so another thing I like to talk about. I'm a big movie guy. Uh, so yep. I gotta ask you because I love talking movies. What is your favorite movie of all time, or just I guess you know some of your favorites? Doesn't have to be one. Oh, um, first one that pops into my head is uh, it's Blue Velvet. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a big David Lynch fan. Hmm. And I've mentioned this 
uh, before, but I, I just kind of like how his movies are uh, open to audience interpretation. Mm-hmm. Like there's, um, have you ever seen Mulholland Drive? No. It's a, uh, I think it's like a 1998 David Lynch movie. Okay. And uh, Lost Highway as well. There's a certain point where you're watching the movie and you as a viewer feel like maybe you have like lost some time or something and something happens that uh, definitely confuses you at first and sets you off off your guard mm-hmm. and then you realize that you kind of just don't know what's going on at a certain <laughs> point and you start to wonder if you missed something or if it's intentional and mm-hmm. you're going to find out later and then you kind of just never really kind of just never really resolves and those are the kind of movies that I think about long after mm. I've seen them. Um, I haven't was... watched any like new movies lately, mm. but uh, yeah, I'm. I, I really need to watch that uh, latest season of Twin Peaks as well. Uh, yeah, I, I, I all my until they all came out first. Mm-hmm. Oh, I have so many friends who are like always telling me you got to watch Twin Peaks, got to watch Twin Peaks. Um, I'm not not really like a big show guy. I think I, like yeah, me either. so I have. I, what do I watch? Like I, I love Shameless. Shameless is like my, my favorite show. So I'm, pr- I'm pretty easy going when it comes to shows. So like, I, I like Shameless. And then I think the last thing I really watched was Breaking Bad. But like, hardcore, huge Breaking Bad fan uh, back in the day. Really I never it. actually watched that one all the way really? through either. Yeah, I've heard wow. it. It's uh, amazing. Yeah, yeah it's, I, I it's like to so get back fun. into it. But yeah, the last like actual like new series of tv i watched was uh that first season of true detective which is mm. now what five years old now mm. <laughs> so yeah i don't really keep up with a lot of new tv uh i watched uh neon genesis evangelion for the first time mm. uh, when i got back from japan actually it was like in november december of last year mm-hmm. and i loved that man that was like i hadn't watched an anime in full in a, in a really long time mm-hmm. and that was that was amazing. I highly recommend if you're into like any sort of uh, giant mecha um, <laughs> fandom to check out uh, Evangelion. Cool. Yeah, that's that's like one. This. I I hear so yeah. many people talk about uh, that guy. I've never been like a, a huge anime fan. I've I've seen like a couple, but like once again, just like the surface area, like surface level ones, uh, like yeah. Attack on Titan. Pretty you know, pretty lame. Nothing nothing really crazy. But everyone always talks about that show. So. Yeah, I think it's influential for a reason. It mm-hmm. was uh, really, really well animated, and um, you can kind of see as it goes on. The uh, the production studio, I guess they lost their budget, and they're were just still trying to make episodes. And the animation gets a little bit more basic mm-hmm. towards the end of the series. And there's like a lot of drawn out frames where they reuse animation from earlier episodes, or That's it'll just be like. A black screen with text on it and it gets it gets really insular Mm -hmm. uh, for the characters Um, so I think that is it's kind of cool how they creatively worked with their financial yeah with what they what they had yeah that is cool I I also love another thing I love and I don't know if this is was the same thing with that another another anime I've seen is um, Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood was one I watched and I know for that one I think what ended up happening was it was either that one or the original Full Metal Alchemist, I'm not really sure, but I think the anime caught up to where the manga was, so oh, yeah. not necessarily like a financial thing they had to figure out, but they almost started to recreate um, or just create their own story because they had to keep me, you know, pushing out episodes, so I love hearing stuff about that, and so that's 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 pretty interesting you brought that up. Yeah, I think that's where they're at with Game of Thrones, right? They're like, they've caught up to the books. I think so, yeah. For... I think this is the last, I think this is the last season. That's another show I've just, I've never watched, but like, everybody I know is just, you know, Game of Thrones is, is everything. I kind of <laughs> lost track in like season three or four. I had like a weekly night with a friend mm-hmm. and we cook some food and drink some beer and watch Game of Thrones, but uh, I think there was one episode where we looked at each other and we were like, who are these characters? How did they get here? And we just hadn't really been paying attention. We had mm-hmm. just kind of been yapping, yapping over the whole thing. So I just would rather be playing video games than like watching stuff. Mm-hmm. I always get kind of like itchy, like, yeah, you can't really do it. You can't like, or, yeah. Or like putting in some kind of input or mm-hmm. something. That's so true. <laughs> um, so for equip, um, 
you know, obviously vinyl now is, is huge in the community. It's, it's just getting bigger and bigger. Um, but in regards to just anything physical release-wise, whether it's vinyl or cassettes or CDs, uh, do you have any further plans um, for further albums in regards to physical releases or repressings or anything kind of like that? Yeah, I hope to do um, a tape for uh, Palace in the Sky. We haven't uh, really talked about it or finalized anything. Mm -hmm. I think we might just wait a while, but now that we're out of the vinyl, it seems like it would be appropriate to do um, a cassette reissue as well. Uh, I know Yeti Records, uh, just in time for our little warehouse show thing we played, they made tapes of uh, Synthetic Core 88. Mm -hmm. Um, and those should be available to purchase like sometime this week. I guess by the time the video comes out, they'll probably be up on the Yeti website. Cool. Uh, these are like, it was like a rush order and they're pretty bare bones, but um, Drew Wise, the artist that did the cover, he made like new original art for the cassette. And it kind of looks like the, um, it's kind of inspired by the box art for like the Super Famicom versions of Final Fantasy 4, 5, and 6 with awesome. the kind of chibi big head characters mm -hmm. on the front um a lot of those like the instruction manuals for them have like really cool detailed character portraits in like a different art style it's not hmm. not yoshitaka amano where they're just kind of like they look like the battle sprites from the game but they're like animated uh so yeah that that should be dropping on i think wednesday uh there's not many of them i think we only made like 50 or so for the show uh, so they'll probably go fast, but we've kind of been talking about doing like a deluxe cassette reissue after that with uh, like a slip cover and maybe some additional like inserts. Um, I thought I always thought it would be cool to make like a little instruction booklet for some. Oh, that is cool. That then, is a cool idea. Um, yeah, uh, Mark, uh, R23X and I have been like just totally... I think we've, we've spent more time planning out the physical release of our record than we have, like, <laughs> making music for it. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, we want to do, like, a, a vinyl with an instruction book. And um, we are talking about doing, uh, like, video game music um, mixes on minidisc. Both him and I found minidisc players at thrift stores recently. Cool. And he, uh, he figured out a way to burn them. So we're going to try to stockpile some some blank mini discs and and do like uh just kind of like a video game music mix mm -hmm. um not sure if we're gonna like try to beat match and pitch match everything and mm -hmm. do it you know all pro style or if we're just gonna put a bunch of tracks we like on there but uh so yeah that's that's kind of the only physical releases i've got planned right now oh yeah yeti yeti records just made uh equip slip mats i've got one on my turntable right now oh very cool uh, it's the uh the character from Synthetic Core, Flora, mm -hmm. uh, that Drew designed, but it's um, uh, artist uh, Vacuum Chan's uh, version of Flora. It's my, my profile picture on Twitter. Very cool. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, because of the Yeti's like uh, printing machine, mm -hmm. they were able to do like two or three color, but not full color. So it's got kind of like a cool pink to purple gradient on it and I, th I think it turned out really nice those will probably be up for sale on wednesday or thursday as well awesome great to hear so equip thank you so much for uh for taking a trip to the pad is there anything else you know a you want to let everybody know about you know you or your music or just just anything at all um no grand bold statements but <laughs> um yeah i think uh I i'm i'm really interested to see where vaporwave will go i think that it has outlasted its um kind of initial lifespan mm -hmm. and it's kind of become something else uh, as evidenced by i mean the huge amount of users now on the the vaporwave subreddit and i mean look at your videos dude you've got like 10k views on some of them uh, it's crazy it seems to me that your channel's like feeding the hungry masses uh, urge for, for vaporwave content. Mm -hmm. And I can only see it getting more popular and mainstream. I think that, uh, was it, uh, Rihanna did that, like, that C weird sea punk thing yeah, on yep. Letterman or something. And that was kind of like the first time that I had seen that, like, weird little internet subgenres get, 
brought into the spotlight. But mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, that your has vaporwave gone too far video. It's like what eighty k views yeah, or something. Yeah, it's 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 absolutely crazy. I think I, I put that one out, and then because usually when I when I put a video out, I like for the first hour I'm just like refreshing YouTube. I'm like, let me see the views. Let me see. Like I get I get so yeah. excited. That one I actually I had a, I I play soccer on the weekends. I'm in like an adult league, so. I, I had to go right to a game, right? Right after it dropped. So I'm like, I'm at the game, whatever. I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, at the game, I'm like, oh my God, I dropped that video. Let me go back. And usually my videos will get maybe like a thousand views, uh, you know, in like the first day or whatever. I go back uh, after, I think, yeah, we played a game. Then we went to the bar at like 11 in the morning. We're like a bunch of degenerates. So we went to the bar, got back, <laughs> got back home. And I, I checked it. I was like, I think it was at like nine or 10,000 views. And it was like 1230 or something. I was like, oh my God. This is crazy. I, I say all the time, I really hope, you know, more people start, obviously, you know, just keep creating music and everything, but more content creators. Because I, I have a very uh, specific style. I feel I'm a very, like, subjective, very just, like, conversational. Not yeah. too, and I want to say not too factual, but, like, not, you know, like, for example, I, have you heard um, or seen Mr. Amazing, his video on vaporwave genre redefined or the home breaking no. down check those out they're actually pretty yeah, sweet man. this guy he's uh he goes by mr amazing on youtube and he does a video breaking down home resonance like note for note and and how you know it just provokes this nostalgic feel literally by looking oh, at the I did watch that one actually. yeah that was that was really well made yeah it's it's amazing and my style is the one where you like animated all the covers and stuff that no, that was the vaporwave one. I know exactly what you're talking. That's where like he makes the shapes on hit vibes like move. Yeah, so, like, that, that was. was, that was I saw that. I was like, holy shit! Like I, crazy. I got some work. I got it. <laughs> but yeah. but yeah, I think there's there's so many different personalities that can go into vaporwave content creation. So hopefully, you know, I, I think vaporwave outlasted its vaporwave is dead demise, and we'll see. Uh, we'll see what the future has for it. It'll be definitely yeah, exciting. Totally. But awesome. So thank you, Equip. I'm excited. We're all excited to see. Uh, what you're going to produce for the future, what you're going to pump out, and uh, hope to hear from you soon, and hopefully we can get this video game thing going. So that'll, yeah, that'll definitely be fun. But yeah, yeah, man. Well, it's been amazing talking to you. Uh, thanks so much for having me at the pad. No problem. I will, uh, I'll talk to you later, and everybody, once again, check out Equip Stuff. I'm going to post everything in the description, links to his albums, his band camp, you know, Twitter, whatever it may be, and uh, give him a listen. So thanks again, everyone, for watching, and me and Equip, we'll see you later.